And it is great to be back at Foundation Church. Mary Helen, my bride of over 56 years, is with me, yes. We always look forward to being here with you. And it's a special privilege to be with you at the start of a new series, Jesus in the Psalms. What a great theme for the coming summer months, Jesus in the Psalms. Certainly, there's much in the Psalms that points us to Jesus. Obviously, the 23rd Psalm, where we hear about the shepherd and Jesus is the good shepherd. The Psalm points us to him. But in passage after passage, there are glimpses of Jesus. So I encourage you, over these months, read the Psalms, and not just the ones that are selected for the, uh, the series messages, but all of the Psalms. Reflect on them. Let the Holy Spirit, who authored the Psalms, open your understanding to great insight in these treasures of the Old Testament. It's interesting to discover that Jesus quotes from the Psalms more than from any other book of the Bible. He quotes from prophets. He quotes from the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. But more times than not, when he quotes Scripture, it's from the Psalms. Interesting, but not really surprising. Keep in mind that the Psalms were the worship songs of the Jewish people, the songs that Jesus grew up singing. He was immersed in these psalms. He knew them word for word, and certainly that would be true of Psalm 1, where we turn our attention this morning. The introductory psalm, sometimes called the gateway psalm because it introduces us to the 149 that follow. Look with me in your Bible, if you have your Bible with you. It's easy to find the Psalms, isn't it? Right in the middle of the Bible. And uh, we don't know who wrote this Psalm. It might have been David who wrote so many of the Psalms. But in any case, here is the description of what we could simply call the blessed life. What is the blessed life? Well, here it is. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction." And immediately, we are reminded of the way Jesus begins his famous Sermon on the Mount. Same way Psalm 1 begins. Blessed, Jesus looks out on that gathering of people on the side of that hill and draws from the words of a song he has sung so many times. Blessed, he says, are the poor in spirit. For they, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for theirs they shall inherit the earth. And on he goes, expanding on the message of Psalm 1 in such a wonderful way. So let's go back to Psalm 1 and uh, focus on what was in Jesus' mind as he spoke those words that day, blessed, the psalmist says. And many of you are aware that word basically means happy. If you were to ask almost anyone, what do you want out of life, you'd probably hear some version of what? I just want to be happy. 
That's what you'd hear. I just want to be happy. And uh, the advertising industry has gone to great lengths to try to offer us what the world thinks would make us happy, but somehow it doesn't do it. No matter what kind of car you drive or clothes you wear or vacation place you enjoy, somehow, even when we acquire those, those positions and privileges and possessions that the world says will bring happiness, it just doesn't do it. Why is that? Someone said it this way, whatever happened to happiness, we all want it, we talk a lot about it, we're in a mad scramble for it, and yet there are so few really happy people. Maybe you've had those same thoughts. Maybe you've asked the same question. Whatever happened to happiness? And, and what it, does it mean to be happy? And what does it take to be truly happy? Is it even possible? Well, the psalmist here tells us the answer is yes. And here is the life that is truly and deeply, genuinely happy. The word in the Hebrew has the idea of being secure and stable. It's the very essence of the, the, the original text. It's a life that is secure, stable, in a state of well-being. It doesn't mean that the person living the blessed life never has difficulty or never encounters hardship or adversity or even experiences suffering. It would be unrealistic to think that we live in this kind of world and be untouched by any of those kinds of experiences. What it does mean, however, that the blessed life, no matter what may be in the past, no matter what pain there might be or dysfunction in the past where we grew up or even abuse that might have been experienced or what is happening now or not happening now, regardless of any of those things, the one who lives the blessed life lives a life that is secure and stable in a state of well-being. Such is the blessed life, the life of the truly happy person. So what's involved? Well, the psalmist tells us there's something excluded and there's something included, and then he's going to show us what this life is really like. First, what's excluded? He begins, blessed is the one who does not, does not walk in step with the wicked and doesn't stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. What's that all about? And who are the wicked, the sinners, and the mockers? Are those, are those different categories or different references to the same crowd? He's really talking about the same crowd. There's the same bunch who have decided that right and wrong do not even exist. And it's all just a matter of opinion. That right and wrong may at some time in the past had some meaning, but not anymore. Maybe never did. And that the only thing that matters is your opinion. And interestingly, they conclude that their opinion is the one that matters most. That their opinion takes precedence over anyone else's opinion, including what God says. In fact, especially what God says. They put their opinion over and above the Word of God. They consider what God says really irrelevant. Blessed, says the psalmist, is the one who doesn't, doesn't go along with that crowd. Secure, stable, in a state of well-being is the man, the woman, the student who would rather stand alone then go along with those who leave God out. You may have been listening to the news a couple of weeks ago and heard the name Harrison Butker. I didn't recognize that name at first. Then I learned that I'd actually watched Harrison play in the Super Bowl. He's the kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs and an outstanding athlete. 
He's largely responsible for why the Kansas City Chiefs are the Super Bowl champions. But Harrison Butker was in the news not because of his kicking ability, but because he had given a commencement address at a Christian university and taken a strong stand, a bold stand, for what God says. You can hear the address online. It's well worth time listening to what he said. What he said was true. And yet there was an avalanche of scorn unloaded on Harrison Butker because of what he said. In fact, angry demands that he be fired from the team. And yet in all of that vitriolic accusation and allegation against him, he remained unshaken, stable, secure. Rather to be out of step and out of favor with the culture in order to be in step with what God says. Blessed, the psalmist would say, it's Harrison Butker. Jesus would say the same thing. Blessed, Jesus said to those gathered on that hillside, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There's something to be excluded in living the blessed life. Not going along with those who leave God out. But the psalmist moves very quickly to what's included. And what's included can be summed up this way. Giving attention to what God says. And applying His Word in our lives. Giving attention. Attention carried into application. Verse 2 says, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night. Is he talking about some monastic kind of life where one pulls away and secludes himself from the world and lives in silent meditation all day, every day, all the time? Is that it? No. That is not what he's describing. What he is describing is someone who lives a normal life with normal activity and normal responsibility and enjoys the pleasures of life that God intends for us, but does so with a focus on what God says. And what God says has his attention or her attention and is put into application. You say, well, what about, what about this delighting in the law? Delighting in the law. Honestly, you might ask, who does that? Doesn't the law just show us how we've messed up? Well, time out. There, there could be a, a very helpful series of messages on the law and the grace of God and to see how those fit together and how God uses the law, yes, for us to see our need and meets our need by the grace of God. But understand that here in this verse, the word law is really referring to the entirety of what God says. Not specifically the commandments, the ten, but the entirety of Scripture. And he's talking about the person who gives attention and applies what God says, contrary to the crowd that leaves God out and considers what God says as really irrelevant. Notice what he says, blessed, blessed is the one who concentrates his focus, his attention, where God has spoken. Look, look with me at Psalm 119. Leave, hold your place here, but turn to Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm, which, by the way, also begins with the word blessed. And in verse 97, here's what we read. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Sounds familiar. It's the same message. But he's going to give us some, some examples of the benefit and the reason that we would delight in our attention to what God says. Verse 98, 
your commands, again, not the ten, but the instructions for living, the principles of wisdom. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. That'd be great not to have any enemies. But if there are enemies, wouldn't it be wonderful to be wiser than they are? To have insight, understanding, discernment. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. As I saturate my mind with what God says, I have perspective. I have understanding. I see how things fit together. I get an edge. I have an advantage. It is to my benefit. He goes on. The following verse, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. He's saying, I I am able to connect the dots in ways that my teachers don't perceive how to do. And it's because I give attention, I focus on what God says. He continues. I have more understanding than the elder. So he's wiser than his enemies, more insight than his teachers, and more understanding than those years ahead of him. How's that happen? He says, I'm wise beyond my years. How has he reached that kind of understanding? It's the same principle. By attending to and applying what God says. He says, I obey your precepts. The result is, I am, I have an understanding beyond my elders. He's also discovered a principle that obedience to what God says brings understanding. Did you catch that? Obedience to what God says brings understanding. I'd like sometimes for God to give me understanding up front, to give me understanding about the why. And what are, God, what are you doing? And give me the why, and then I will obey. But it's the other way around. Obedience, taking God at His word, trusting God to know what He's doing when I don't understand. But obedience comes first, and following that is understanding. Go back with me now to Psalm 1, and look at the result of all that we've just seen. Verse 3, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. What person is he talking about? The one who gives attention to what God says and applies God's Word in the practical matters of everyday living. That person is like this tree planted by streams of water and... Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. What a contrast. On the one hand, those who give attention to what God says are like a tree planted by streams of water, the roots going down deep into the subsoil where they receive the the intake of moisture, giving that tree, the ability to thrive and to flourish and to bear much fruit, the leaves not withering, that's a picture of this blessed life contrasted with chaff. What is chaff? Well, it's the husk that surrounds a kernel of grain that has to be separated from that grain. It's what happens in the harvesting process or the the threshing process. In ancient times, they did that by tossing the grain up in the air, continued to toss it, and the husk would loosen from around the kernel. And then as it came separate from the kernel, they kept tossing it in the air, and the wind would blow the husk or the chaff away the kernel of grain heavier than the chaff would drop to the threshing floor. That's how they did it. What a contrast. Which would you rather be? Like a tree planted by streams of water constantly flourishing and thriving. Or like chaff blown away by the wind. It's a picture of the difference between the one who gives attention to what God says, and those, on the other hand, who do their own thing and consider their opinion to be better than anyone else's. 
Notice the last words of verse 3. Whatever they do prospers. Meaning the person described here, giving attention to the principles of God's Word and applying the wisdom God gives us in their lives has an outcome that makes great sense and great benefit and brings great joy because they have the, the ability to see how to navigate life, how to handle conflict successfully, how to manage responsibility well, how to handle finances, and on and on. The point is the principles of God's Word lead to a successful life. Wouldn't you rather have success in living? Does it really make that much difference how we respond to what God says? It really does. That's why Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount with a story about two builders. You remember the story. One a wise builder, the other foolish. They both build houses. Jesus describes what happened. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, that is, they give attention, and puts them into practice, they apply his word. Everyone who does that is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Well, because it was built. Its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, it's the same storm, the same impact from the wind, the rain, the streams, but beating against that house, it fell with a great crash. Same storm, different outcome. Why? Well, we understand. One built on rock, the other built on sand. The outcome was predictable. Likewise, the one who hears the Word of God and applies His Word, predictable outcome. The one who considers the Word of God irrelevant and does their own thing, predictable outcome. The blessed life comes from attention to what God says and applying His Word in our lives. I can't imagine doing life any other way. It was summer, 16 years ago now. I had a phone call from our son, Chris. I could tell something was wrong as soon as I heard his voice. He said, Dad, I need you to pray for Eliana. Now, Eliana was a tiny little girl, less than a year old, almost a year old, who my son and his wife, Lindsay, were in process of adopting in Guatemala. The foster mom had heard Eliana choking during the night and discovered that she was having difficulty breathing. She rushed her to the hospital in Guatemala City. The doctors there diagnosed her as having asthma. And the, mo the foster mom was told, if you'd been 15 minutes longer getting here, she would have died. I could hear the fear in my son's voice, in his heart. And I began to feel that same fear in my heart. I prayed with him on the phone, and we talked a bit further. And after we hung up, I kept thinking about that little girl, that precious little girl struggling to breathe so far away. And I turned to a verse of Scripture in Isaiah, where I had often turned before, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord through the prophet. Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I pray, Lord, would you hold Eliana in your hands 
and enable her to breathe. And the fear that had been growing in my own heart began to recede. But better than that, a little girl in a far-off place was able to breathe. And the proceedings went forward with the adoption, and she became our granddaughter. And this summer, she will be 17. I, I cannot imagine doing life and dealing with what life brings our way. I cannot imagine doing that without giving attention to what God says and applying His Word in our lives. You say, well, John, glad for you and your family, but what if there's an unexpected turn of events and the outcome is far from what you would ever have wanted? What then? Well, it happens that my wife and I have some experience with that very kind of turn. And Tuesday, this week, we'll celebrate the birth of our first son, John Jr. Born to us when we were married college students. And on that day of his birth, we were so excited to hold our son in our arms. We had no idea that day that we would also see the last day of his life on this earth. Well, almost four years ago now, on a Saturday morning, John went home to heaven, 52, and our hearts broke. And we were plunged into that valley that David talks about in the 23rd Psalm, that dark valley. But we also have experienced from that time to this the comfort that is promised in those words of Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, literally it's the valley of the shadow. It's what the original text actually says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It is His presence that changes everything. It is His presence that makes all the difference. Plus, and this is a very big plus, the assurance of His presence with us. has with it also the assurance of John's being present with Jesus. He is with us, and John is with him. And John is not just in our past. He's in our future. And I can't begin to tell you how important that has been to both of us over these months and years to know with all our heart the assurance that John is not just in our past. He's in our future. One more reason why I really can't imagine doing life without giving attention to what God says and applying His Word in our lives. Life is just too complicated to do it any other way. Let me pray for us. Would you bow your heads with me? Before I lead us in this prayer, it may be that you're like the guy who said, whatever happened to happiness. And you've tried everything you can think of, and still there's just no real happiness. There's a reason for that. 
The only source of what you're seeking is found in the one who made us for relationship with himself. His name is Jesus. And if you've never opened your heart to him, there couldn't be a better time than right now. You could pray something like this. In fact, you could say these same words I'm about to say in your heart, but you're saying them to Jesus. Jesus, I believe you gave yourself for me on that cross. As well as I know how, I turn my back on sin, and I trust you, Jesus, to be my Savior my forgiver and Lord of my life. I place my trust in you and choose to give attention to what you say and apply your word in my life. If you prayed those words just now, welcome to a brand new life and to the family of God. And Father, thank you that you do what you say and we can trust your word whether we understand the situation or not, may we be attentive hearers and apply your word in our lives that we might live the blessed life with you now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.